Thank you, thank you. Great to be here tonight, and I'm glad to see you. Would everyone stand, please, and take your Bible and hold it up over your head. Hold up your Bible above your head and repeat after me. I believe the Bible is God's Word. I, God is God's word. I hold it above my head because what's in here is better than what's in here. And I want to think God's thoughts after him and conform my life to God's ways. Now, Holy Spirit, who inspired the Bible, come and help me as I open my heart to agree with you tonight in this room. For my joy and your glory, amen. Amen. All right. We're going to start with Ephesians 4.11. Can we get that up on the overhead, please? If you don't have your Bibles. Ephesians 4.11. The fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. How many of you wish you were in the ministry? Would you raise your hand, please? How many of you wish you were in the ministry? Okay, that's a, that, that's a trick question. Sorry. I hope, I hope a lot of you knew that already. Um, because look at the next verse, 412. Jesus himself gave some to be apostles and prophets and pastors, evangelists and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So who does the work of the ministry? The saints. All right. So uh, what I want to do is try to get you as excited this evening about serving God tomorrow wherever you're going as God is because God is looking forward to serving with you. But I want to start by sharing just a little bit about some of the confusion I had when I was growing up. Uh, my dad's a pastor. He was a fine one. He's retired now. And, uh, but I grew up believing that what you do with your life is dependent on how committed you are. That the most committed Christians are the missionaries. Those are the ones who are out there living in those mud huts and sharing the gospel with people in a language they don't understand and are just learning and with uh, cultural ways that seem weird and strange to us. And, but if you're not that committed, then you could always become a pastor. You could go to Bible college and seminary um, and become a pastor and preacher or even a traveling evangelist. However, if you weren't committed enough to God to do that, then you'd have to take one of the other jobs in the world that lukewarm Christians handle and just try to make the best of it. <laughs> now, is that screwed up or what? Yeah, and, well, I, I believed it. Now, I, my dad never said it, I'm sure. But somehow I gained that and I went to a... A Christian college where it said it was uh, continued to be promoted somehow backwards and I didn't know that it was a religious spirit lying to me. There were some other things that went along with it that wealth means wickedness and that politicians was that was just a white collar crime job. Uh oh. Now, that might be getting a little uncomfortable. But those are lies also from a religious spirit who wants to keep you from serving God where you are with joy and faith because you think that, well, I wasn't a missionary and I'm not a pastor, so I guess I'm just going to have to do what's left over. <sighs> Poor me. See, and if you have that attitude, then you're not going to be looking forward to work. Looking forward to work. God created you to work. That's why you get satisfaction out of working. And that's why it's so frustrating when you can't find a job. Because you were made to work. God created Adam and Eve, put them in the garden and gave them work to do. And so if you don't have a job, your job is to get one. Like our pastors say from time to time, it's true. And if you do have a job, then it's time to start loving Monday. There's a guy by the name of John Beckett that wrote a book entitled Loving Monday. 
1998. Let's see, the subtitle is Succeeding in Business Without Selling Your Soul. He built a business that he took from his father into a $100 million a year sales with over 600 employees following biblical principles. And if you'd like to find out more about it, get a copy. I've got it. It's really good stuff. John Beckett, uh, Loving Monday. And then eight years later, he wrote another one, Mastering Monday, a practical guide to integrating faith and work. Now, I, I want to add a verse that's not, I uh, didn't include in the PowerPoint for those who are back there. But uh, if you take a quick look with me at Exodus 31. You know, we have a tendency to think that when the Holy Spirit fills people, it's to preach. If you read in the book of Acts, the Spirit of God came on Peter and he preached. The Spirit of God fell on Paul and he preached. Uh, John was filled with the Holy Spirit and proclaimed. Um, but we see that there's more about what the Holy Spirit does than that. Um, this might surprise you, but it says about Samson in first no, pardon me, in the book of Judges, that the Holy Spirit came on Samson and he did some of these several miraculous things that he did as a deliverer of his people. Now, what you're looking at here in Exodus 31, the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, the son of Uri. Yeah, verse 3. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge, and all kinds of craftsmanship to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. Can you imagine the Holy Spirit filling you so that you can design things and invent things and build things and, yeah, be a plumber, an electrician, a, a framer? I love framing. I have a general contractor's license. And I really love to frame because you put those studs up there and you put them together the right way and, man, you can build a house around it. It's cool. It feels great because God made us to do stuff like this and he fills us with his spirit so we can do it better than the world. The Christians should be the best employees in the world. Also, I have given to you... Uh, Ahaliab, the son of Ahizermach of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I have given skill to all the craftsmen to make everything I have commanded you. And then he lists them all, the things that are, that are in there in Exodus. So, you know, God likes to do this stuff. Did you know that God made you so he could go to work with you tomorrow? What's in it for God? Yeah, glory. He's going to get glorified. You're getting, boy, you're snooping and picking up what's next. All right. So God has been looking forward to going to work with you so that he could live through you. You know, uh, there, were, uh, there was a period of time a few years ago um, when it was upfront emphasized Sunday after Sunday. It's still true. And the, our lead pastors lead, teach this. And I love the way Pastor Jim said it. Why, why do I go to work? Well, because the state pays me to put on my uniform so I can let Jesus shine through me Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at Rialto High School where I teach chemistry. You see, I'm a volunteer here like you are. I tell people that we have 19 pastors at The Rock and 18 of them get paid. I'm good for nothing. <laughs> like the rest of you who are volunteers. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to serve God just for the fun of it, because we want to. Hallelujah! <laughs> but I'd like to take you from, also, from being glad to serve God in church and on the church campus to being delighted to get to serve Him tomorrow wherever you're going. Um, we want to go next to uh, Matthew 3.17. Matthew 3.17. Now, this is a passage, let's see, is this an up yet? Um, a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, there's a little more to it than that. There was a dove that came down. Heaven was opened. And this is the first time in the Bible where we see the Trinity, all three of them separate at the same time. 
the Spirit of God coming down like a dove, the voice of the Father from heaven, and God the Son standing in the water where he was just baptized, coming up soaking wet like some of you will be next week. Isn't that a wonderful thing that you get to be baptized too? Oh man, that's really cool. Anyway, what did God say? This is my beloved son. Oh, this is my boy. I like him. Now I want you to ask yourself, what ministry had Jesus done that made the Father say this about him? Had he preached any sermons? Had he saved any souls? Had he healed any sick? Had he raised any dead? Well, then what was the Father saying this about him for? What made God the Father so delighted in Jesus when he wasn't in the ministry of the Word? Enough to open heaven and say, this is my boy. I like him. See, some of us have the idea that we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, after we die. How would you like to hear this tomorrow about noon? <laughs> All right. So, you see, God's got a plan in mind. God puts you where you are because he wants you there. Um, it was very frustrating to me after going to seminary, being a professional pastor for 15 years, getting paid for it, to leave the church and not be a pastor anymore. Now, God told me I wasn't to be the pastor in charge. Only I didn't believe him because it came from a man instead of him. But it was his word, and I didn't accept it. And I tried to start a church anyway, and it made it really hard on my family for about five years. It's amazing how kind God was to me during that time. But if some of you want to be pastors of little churches, you don't know what you want. <laughs> Let me tell you, I was pastor of small churches for about 15 years. And it is not fun if God isn't blessing it. You are surrounded by small-minded people who determine how little you get paid and how little they're going to do and how bad your working circumstances is going to be. And it is a miserable situation if God hasn't called you and equipped you for that. Now, God had called me and equipped me the years before, and I had wonderful ministry in a mainline denomination, saving souls that were members of, church, they were members of the church, but they didn't know Jesus yet. And I had a wonderful time helping many of them get to know Jesus personally. We had a very fruitful ministry, and we saw a number of miracles happen. And so, you know, God was in it, but then he said to get out of it, and I didn't believe him. And then finally I decided, I realized, you know, God spoke to me one night and said... You're not providing for your family. Now, wait a minute, God. I've been serving you all these years. But my argument didn't make any difference. So I had to do something. Get a job. So I made a list. I made a list of eight things in the order I would like to do them. And attempted them over the next six weeks. Number one, crossed off. Two, crossed off. Three, crossed off. Four, crossed off. This was the recession in the uh, early 90s. It was uh, 1993, 1992, somewhere in there. My eighth and last one was to substitute teach. And when I couldn't do anything else, I started substitute teaching. And after about five months of that, I got to realizing, shoot, this is not hard. I can do this better than the guys I'm substituting for. And then I could get the whole salary and benefits instead of this little bit of money I'm getting. So I, <laughs> I figured it out. God bless me. I got my credential and uh, got a job teaching. And I, and, but, you see, it was all in my mind. It was temporary because the real ministry was in the church. So I thought, well, I'll do this two or three years. And after three years, well, maybe four or five. And I'm where some of, I was where some of you are, not liking your job, wishing you didn't have to do it, wondering why you don't get to do what you really felt called to do and what you really wanted to do. And it is so frustrating. It took, some of us take longer to learn than others. <laughs> anyway, I finally got to where I realized that I was where God wanted me to be at Rialto High School teaching chemistry. Now, that was 
that's where I hope a number of you can get tonight without having to go through what I went through. <laughs> because you are where God wants you to be. And if you're not, then you better act like you are where you want to be and make it as best as you can so God can promote you because promotion comes from God. If you don't like your job, then do it better until you get promoted or God brings you another one. Yeah, because you're there for a purpose. Now, let's take a start looking at this purpose. The message tonight is on ministering, minister with joy and faith. Because God wants to minister with you tomorrow with joy and faith. Where you're going, whether you're a full-time home mom, or whether you are picking up trash cans and putting them in the dump, or whether you are cleaning motel rooms. It doesn't matter. Wherever you are, you're there because God wants you to be a light and salt in that place. So let's take a look at uh, our real text tonight, and that's Matthew 5, chap uh, chapter 5 in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, starting with verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Now, the you is plural. Those of us who like the King James Version, whenever it says ye, Y-E, that's Old English for plural you. Who is the salt of the earth? Christians. We are. Now, what happens, though, if we don't act like salt? If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under foot of men. Now, what we're doing tonight is taking a look at how to minister with joy and faith. The effects of doing good works, because that's what we're supposed to do, good works. What, is the, what are the effects of doing good works with joy and faith? The first effect is this, number one, from verse 13... We are preservative, we preserve society, society and arouse faith. Now, why does society need salt for preserving? Well, I teach chemistry. There's a law called the second law of thermodynamics. That almost rings no bells with anybody. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. What it, what it means is, <laughs> what it means is that that, that <laughs> chaos happens automatically. The second law of thermodynamics is the reason that your car breaks down, the reason that your house falls apart, the reason that you have to repair the plumbing, the reason that your body slows down and gets sick easier and takes longer to heal the older you get. That's because of the second law of thermodynamics. And it's also true in, uh, in society Society tends to break down unless there are things pushing it up. Unless there are preservatives that preserve it to keep it strong, the society goes down. We see, we, we're so frustrated with what's going on in Libya and other parts of North Africa because they have been dominated by a very bad religion and very bad laws for a long time. But you don't remember, historically, there was a time when North Africa was more strongly and thoroughly Christian than Europe. What happened to the powerful North African church that gave us amazing theologians like St. Augustine and powerful missionary sending churches? The salt lost its savor. There was a time in American history in the 1840s just following the Second Great Awakening when there was a, a Frenchman who visited, I think he was French, <laughs> I'm not even remembering his name, I wasn't planning on saying this, but it just came to mind. He was visiting the United States, traveled around, was amazed at the righteousness of the nation, 
amazed at the self-control of the people of the United States. This was in uh, the late 1840s, near the end of about a 15-year period where there was an amazing awakening that had gone on through the church. And he said, what makes America great is its righteousness. What makes America righteous are its pulpits. Now, because the pulpits were aflame with righteousness, because the presence of God was powerful on the church, the people were hearing and obeying, and the land was righteous, and the laws were in agreement with God's word, and the society was blessed, and for decades, well, except for the Civil War, which the devil always tries to tear up things when it starts getting too good for him to control anymore, and the Civil War was the, the devil's answer to the Second Evangelical Awakening, which didn't have to happen that b way, by the way, if the church had done what it was supposed to. The church, no, I'm not talking about the institution. I'm talking about us. We are the church. If the church, the people who believe in Jesus, will believe and do and follow and pray and influence the way, as they can, then we can make it the way God wants it and we'll have God's protections. And when we stop being the salt, because we lose our savor, then we're good for nothing but to be cast down and trodden underfoot of men. What this means is, what is the alternative to Christians being salt in society? There isn't one. God has no plan B. If we don't do it, it ain't going to get done. Now, there's a second thing that salt does. It not only preserves, it makes us thirsty. Some of you are old enough, perhaps, to remember what it means to salt the oats. They put salt in the oats so that the horses would want to drink, and then they would drink what they needed to to stay healthy. And they put salt uh, bo boxes out uh, where the cows were so that they would lick the salt licks, and then it would make them thirsty, and they'd go to where the water is. And another way that we are salt, you and I are salt in the earth, is that we can make the world hungry for what we've got. I got one of the highest compliments I ever received last week from a girl in one of my chemistry classes. After sixth period, the bell rang and everyone had gone out and she stood there and said, how come you're happy all the time? <laughs> well, you know what? I told her, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. God is good, and he's good to me, and I talked to him this morning, and he loves me. That's why I'm happy. Now, you know, it wasn't, I, you're saying, well, what happened? What happened? Did she become a Christian? I don't know. She might be one already, but it, she wasn't ready to hear the rest of it. She just wanted to ask the question, you know? Sometimes people aren't ready. And we do a disservice when we try to shove stuff down people's throat when they're not ready for it yet. One of the most effective things you can do for the salvation of the people around you is stay friendly with them and share from time to time so they know you care so that when they come to a crisis, which they're going to, they'll know who to talk to about it. You see, it's called, yeah, it's re relational evangelism. And, and because, so you don't want to drive people away by holding up the repent or go to hell sign. <laughs> Even though it's true. But see, if they know you care, then, then you'll be one that they talk to when things go downhill. And that's when God opens the doors for learning to happen. And I've had the joy of seeing a number of students born again, some of them in my classroom, while we prayed for them because they came wanting what God had for them. And when they get ready, and that, that's, a, that's a fun thing to do. But one of the best ways that you can use to salt the oats is share answers to prayer. Did you know that everybody is interested in answers to prayer? We are in a society that loves, fascinated by the supernatural. They go to movies about it. They hear songs about it. They read books about it. They want magic. Magic has nothing on God. <laughs> 
And if you say, you know, God answered a prayer for me yesterday. Wow, everybody's listening. <laughs> kind of fun. Two weeks ago this morning, I was preaching in a little city called Huachuca City because Linda and I were in Huachuca City to help my dad and mom repair some things on their house. And I got to preach at my dad's church. He was pastor there for a few years, and he's not anymore, of course. But uh, I, I was preaching there, and... Uh, you know, it, it's an honor to preach no matter who you're preaching to. This is a little congregation of, I counted them. There were 34 people there that morning. And I was the youngest one. <laughs> except, except for a 10-year-old girl. <laughs> yeah, and you can think, well, come on, you know, big deal. Well, listen, God loves them too. And I told the Lord... I said, you know, because I knew what I wanted to preach, and I felt the Lord say, no, do this instead. Oh, really? <sighs> okay, it's your church. Yes, Lord. I can follow what you say. And so I did. And afterwards, I said, you know what, God, that really felt good. And if you like how I did it, would you give me another opportunity to preach again? That was two weeks ago, yeah? I mean, you don't have to talk about prayers 17 years old. If you don't have an answer to prayer last week, what's wrong with your prayer life? Serious, serious. You need to be praying so you can get answers, so you can share them, so people will want to hear about it. And then when somebody takes the Lord's name in vain, you don't have to look down at him and scowl like you're the teacher and ready to slap him on the palm for saying a bad word. You can say, oh, you know what? I used that name in prayer three days ago, and you know what happened? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> you see, God wants to go with you to work tomorrow so you can be salt and make them thirsty for what they need. All right. I like the way Pastor Deborah put it once, too. She's said this several times, and I just love it. You see, Jesus is the light. I'm getting into the next verse already. We're supposed to shine. Jesus is the light, and he puts us on, like clothing, and he wears us. He wants to wear you to work tomorrow. Now, see, you expect God to meet you at church, don't you? Yes. Isn't that wonderful, having a church where you expect God to meet you when you go there? Oh, man, I like that so much. I've been in so many churches where people don't expect that because they don't have a history of reason to expect it. But we do here because God comes here. Yes. yes. But I want you to also expect to have fun ministering with Jesus tomorrow. Oh, yeah. yeah? Joy and faith, just like when you come to, to, to participate and be blessed by the ministry and minister to God in worship. Yes, Pastor David? To minister to God in worship. I hope you come longing to minister to God in worship and praise. But you can long to go with God tomorrow. Jesus is going to be there. You can ignore him like you usually do. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm talking to me too. You know, it's, it's so easy to get caught up in what's going on that we forget that Jesus is there and he's got a reason for us being there. He wants to be there with you tomorrow. He has been wanting that for a long time. So make him happy. Give him what he wants when you go to work with him tomorrow. Okay, let's go to the next verse. We may not get through all of this. <laughs> verse 14, you are the light of the world. Jesus is the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, right? In John, right? John 6. Now, here we are in Matthew 5, where Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Wait a minute. Can both of these be true? Yep. We put on Jesus. Jesus wears us. And what makes me shine is Jesus. You see, I want to have a supernatural life. I don't want to have another day just like a bunch of other days when nothing worthwhile or significant happened. I don't want another boring day. I'm a pleasure seeker. Righteous pleasure. I want to have satisfaction and joy. 
I, I want to see God with me. You see, there's a parallel universe to this physical universe. And sometimes they touch. And it's a great thing to have a church where they touch so often you can expect to experience God when you go to church. But you can also expect to experience God and for that touch to come down wherever you go. Because you're going to be able to minister to people that won't come here. You're going to be able to minister to people that go to some other church that don't know about this stuff. And God wants them to experience that touch between the two parallel universes also. When the words of knowledge and the words of wisdom and the healing happens. It's an amazing thing. I've occasionally had the, the fun and joy during a chemistry class session. Somebody's sitting down here, oh, I have a headache today. So I'm teaching and I walk around and get the kids doing something. And then I come over to that person and say quietly, would you like me to pray for you for about five seconds? Why? You said you had a headache. Oh, yeah, it's awful. Well, oh, sure. Put my hand on their forehead and say, headache, in the name of Jesus, get the hell out. <laughs> Amen. They look around. <laughs> I get this strange thing, and then I say, well, did it leave? Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> well, thank Jesus. And then we go back to chemistry, see? Because <laughs> God just loves to show up and do stuff. <laughs> and you don't have to have a seminary degree or an ordination papers to do that. You really don't. I mean, that makes life exciting. I have a reputation at my high school. People with headaches come to see me. <laughs> I, it was several years ago. I was walking out late after, because, you know, if you're really doing your job right, it takes time. And sometimes it takes extra time. And so I was walking out late, and it was about uh, 4 o'clock, and I met a secretary walking out towards the car. We met in the parking lot. She was walking towards her car. I was walking towards mine. And I noticed she was really looking down. And I said, what's the matter? She said, I've got a migraine headache. <sighs> I got to go home. And I said, do you get these very often? She said, yeah, I usually get them about every three or four weeks. And I said, do they hit you very hard? She said, yeah, I usually have to. I, it, it came about the middle of the day, but I stayed because I know that I probably won't be back for two or three days. And I needed to get some things organized so that it'll be OK. And I said, would you mind if I prayed for you for a moment? No. What do you mean? And I said, well, in the name of Jesus, just a real simple short prayer. She said, oh, I'm Catholic. And I said, good. <laughs> would you like for me to pray for you for a moment in Jesus' name? She said, sure. So I put my hand on her forehead and said, headache in the name of Jesus, get the hell out. <laughs> she looked up at me and said, What? And I said, well, is it still there? She said, oh, no, it's not. It's gone. It's gone. Now, one of the exciting things was to, the next day she was back at work. And six months later, she came to my room and she said, do you remember when you prayed for me in the parking lot and that migraine headache left? And I said, yeah. She said, I haven't had a single one since. I didn't know what God wanted to do, but I did enough so that God can do what he wanted to, and he did a lot more than I was asking for. I mean, you know, I, you know, I don't want to make this about me, because it's not. It's about Jesus. Jesus, you can, you can walk with Jesus just like I do. How did Jesus know what he wanted the Father to do? Well, he said, I do what I see the Father doing, and I say what I hear the Father saying. So all you have to do is start listening and watching. It's not hard. It's not rocket science. It really isn't. It's so simple. And it doesn't have to be big stuff. I mean, if we're shining, where were we? <laughs> I forgot my text here. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. People don't light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Light. Forgot where I was going. 
Oh, well, it'll come back. Um, why do people need light? Because it's such a dark world. You know, I'm amazed at the stupid things people believe. You know, uh, there are girls in my chemistry classroom, they're usually 15 or 16 years old when I'm teaching them. And uh, some of these girls have learned somehow to expect to be used. To expect that they're going to be used like their mom and grandma were, or like their sisters and aunts were, and they're just going to be used and abused, and that's part of life. That is so sad. And, and there are teachers who believe amazingly stupid things. <laughs> and my, te my students, I have a wisdom corner, and I put stuff up on it. Um, and, and they come in and, and occasionally talk about what other teachers put on their boards that's so contrary to what I'm putting on mine. And I'm thinking, what's going on? Well, that's how, how I got started, actually. I was only there my second year. I, by the way, I've been teaching. This is my 18th year teaching. And, and by, I have, uh, there are more than 3,000 students that have been through my classes. And I'm praying for every single one of them to get to heaven and have been for a while. And then one of the joys here is that from time to time, a student will come, uh, somebody in their 20s will come up and say, do you remember me? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I was one of your students, but I got saved since I started coming to the rock. Answer to prayer, hallelujah. Um, yeah, it's amazing what some people believe. I, I, I had uh, the, the first year I was there, um, there was a, my, my principal was a Roman Catholic. She was a very quiet Catholic. Um, the principal I have now is a Roman Catholic, and he sits in the parking lot every morning with his rosary and prays before he comes in. I mean, this is a man who really wants God to bless our school. And there are several of us who pray with him and for him. And when you get to a dark place, it doesn't matter where the light's coming from as long as it's light. Yeah? And so they don't have to be members of the rock to participate. We, I've, I've got some really great Christian brothers and sisters at the high school where I am from churches all over the map. But God is hearing our prayers. God is meeting with us. God is using with us. We're raising a light on our campus, and God is doing good stuff there, not near as much as he's going to, which is the reason why I'm still there. You see, I, I kept wanting to get away, and God kept wanting me to stay. And if this recession had ha hadn't happened, I would have retired two years ago. And then I wouldn't have the influence I have now because God wants us to be light wherever we go. Um, uh, for those of you who are uh, also uh, public school teachers, I found out that I can write a birthday letter, write a Christmas letter, print it on my paper that I buy and I pay the print for, take it to school done, hand it to students, and it's a personal gift from me to them. And I've seen, it was several years ago that I had uh, two or three Buddhist girls in one of my classes, the same period, the same year. And at the end of the school year, they still had that Christmas letter that I gave them on the front of their notebook because it touched their hearts so much. And that was, in, in the Christmas letter, I invite them to pray the sinner's prayer and give their lives to Jesus after I talk about Jesus coming into the world. Now, when I started doing that, it got, word got around and an administrator came because, you see, we don't do this without pushback. And he said, you can't do that. And I said, well, what is it specifically that I can't do? Well, you can't give them a letter. And I said, I paid for it. I wrote it. I printed it. It's not from the school, and they know that. Well, how do you give it to them? Well, um, I hand... I, pass it out to them at the end of class the day before Christmas break. And he says, you can't do that during the school time. And I said, okay, um, what do you recommend that I do instead? He says, not do it. And I said, that's not acceptable. I don't give up my rights as an American citizen to free speech when I walk onto this campus. 
And he said, well, I guess you could give it to him after the bell rings. I said, OK, that works. Matter of fact, I won't even give it to them. I'll just put it there and let them take one if they want, after the bell rings. And everyone takes them. You know, and I asked, I asked this first Christian principal, I said, you know, there are social studies teachers and some others that are putting up some pretty wild philosophical stuff on their boards for their students to understand. Is there any objection? Why can't I put something up from the Bible? And she said, well, maybe you just need to not say the Bible or give the reference, but put Mark the Evangelist. Oh, okay. <laughs> and and so, so I'm, we have the opportunity to bring light into dark places, and it does make a difference. It really does. Uh, we can get them to thinking about things. Uh, let's go to uh, the... The next one, I'm missing my points here. Really what I wanted to do, my real purpose tonight is get you excited about serving Jesus tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday. So the a second thing, they dispel darkness with light. Good, we've been talking about that already. Let's go to the third one, which is the 16th verse. In the same way, let your sh light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and give praise to your Father who is in heaven. The, the third good effect of these good works is that it brings glory to God and it brings praise to God. It moves people who watch to glorify God. Um, you know, I noticed when I was studying this that it matches something. Uh, all of us want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Isn't that right? Yeah. I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. Well, what's God's overarching purpose in history? Those of you who have been in the class that I teach on Old Testament survey, should remember, I hope, that God's overarching purpose in history is for the world, this is uh, from Numbers 14, 21, that the earth may be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so God's purpose that's going to be accomplished, and I wish I had time to develop this text in its context, because it's in the context of smash on God's plan for Israel after he brought him out of Egypt and before he got him to Canaan. And God says, oh yeah, the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, even if it takes 40 more years in this little part of it than I had wanted. But God's got his plan. Now, are we going to participate or not? So we get the joy of the overarching purpose of God helping it happen in history. We say around here very often, the Inland Empire shall be saved. What does it mean that the Inland Empire shall be saved? What will the Inland, look like, Inland Empire look like when it is saved? Now we want everybody to be personally saved so they can go to heaven and have their sins forgiven. Hallelujah. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Talk in tongues. Enjoy life in the Spirit. Wow, that's the best thing that can happen on earth. But that's not the whole thing about the Inland Empire being saved. The Inland Empire is going to be saved when every little corner has the light of God shining brightly in it. There's a, a, a graphic that I want to show you now that uh, on the seven mountains, uh, reclaiming the seven mountains of society, business, government, family, religion, media, education, entertainment. These are places where we need to go and climb up the mountain. What mountain are you in? I'm in the education mountain. What mountain are you in? I want to challenge you. I believe God wants to challenge you to climb it. How can you climb that mountain and increase your influence so that your effectiveness as salt and light will be magnified? Let's go to the next slide. And I've got three little ideas here for you that uh, I'm not going to spend any time on except to show them to you. Climb your mountain three ways. Earn more than you get paid. How many think you don't get paid as much as you deserve? You don't have to raise your hand on that. If you're a Christian full of the Holy Spirit, you better not get paid as much as you deserve because there ain't enough money. 
So you need to earn more than you deserve, more than you get paid, to show that Jesus is in you and you're different from the ones that don't have the supernatural power or wisdom of the Holy Spirit to make it happen. Here's a second one. Make your supervisor succeed as long as what he wants you to do is godly. You see, you not only need to fulfill your own job description, but help your supervisor match his or hers so that they look good to their boss and supervisor. That's when you're doing it right. And one more. Don't quit too soon. See, I wanted to quit. Because I've got some other ideas. But you know, I'm still a young man. I still intend to have 25 to 35 more years of ministry after I retire whenever I get to it. <laughs> hey, listen, Joshua at 80 said, I want that mountain. And he went after it and he led the army and he wielded his sword and he took the mountain. But I want you to think about it. I don't think that that happened because he was lazy for 40 years and then suddenly, bam, the Spirit of God fell on him. That's not the way it works. I think during those 40 years, he was counting them down, putting a notch on his sword. All right, I'm going to practice this kind of footwork and this kind of sword work during year two and this kind during year five, and this kind during year 13. And in year 21, he was still out there exercising. And in year 37, he was still running around the mountain, getting his five kilometers in to maintain his strength, to get his exercise, so that when he was 80, he could be ready to take the enemy. Now, are you getting ready to serve God or not? Are you excited about the ministry or doesn't it matter to you? It matters to God. He wants stuff to happen where you're going tomorrow that won't happen unless you're aware of his presence and listening to him. Most of the stuff that God says we don't get in the early morning prayer time. That's just getting our minds and hearts set so that while we're going through the day and the ideas come, we can do them. Boy, I've got some other good stuff here and we're running out of time. Let me share just two of them real quick. Um, about being a parent and a grandparent. Sarah and Jonathan Edwards had 1,400 direct descendants over the 200 years after they lived. In America, Jonathan Edwards was a theologian and a pastor and a preacher and he was the main leading light of the first great evangelical awakening in the 1740s in this country. But among those descendants, those 1,400 descendants, were three college presidents, 65 college professors, 100 lawyers, 30 judges, 66 medical doctors, 80 holders of public office, including three senators, three governors, and one vice president of the United States. Now, don't tell God that being a mom isn't enough. Your, what, what if Jesus comes tonight? We need to be ready for him. What if he doesn't come for 200 years? What are you doing to equip your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren to be salt and light as long as Jesus needs them to be until he comes or takes them home? See, don't underestimate what God wants you to do. My mom, she's watching. Hi, Mom. In uh, southeastern Arizona, Huachuca City. I found out two weeks ago while we were there that when Mom had... We, we, I'm one of six children. And when, uh, when, when she had six of us and the youngest was a little under one year old, she had a regular practice of singing songs of praise to God while she was working all day long in her house. And they didn't have air conditioning back then, so this was in the 19, around 1950, and uh, so the windows were open. 
and there was a neighbor across the open field who also had her windows open. And by listening to my mom sing, knowing what, how many children she had and how, life, how hard life was for her, she was drawn to God and became a Christian. You know, sometimes the little things make a big difference if you just keep living for Jesus. Because it's Jesus that we want to live for. Now, I, I need to turn this for a moment because some of you can't let Jesus shine out of your lives because he doesn't live there yet. Or you invited him in a while back and since sort of closed him off in a little room where he has to stay so you can do life the way you want to. And before we get to the... I'm going to ask everybody to make a commitment about being excited and planning on shining for Jesus next week. But first I need to ask for those of you who don't have Jesus where you know he needs to be in charge of your life to repent and come to Jesus. Because the truth is, the message I shared two weeks ago in my parents' church was about Jesus from the book of the Revelation. And did you know that Jesus is going to be the judge on the great white throne? And if your name isn't written in the Lamb's book of life because you put Jesus first and keep him there, then you're going to the bad judgment where Jesus is not going to be your friend because you will have to pay the consequences for pushing him back or out or never letting him in. And so I'm inviting you tonight to ask yourself, is Jesus in control of my life? You see, it says in 1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has life. And he who has not the Son of God does not have eternal life. And, and if you are beginning to taste tonight the joy you might have by living Jesus out in your life, but now are acutely aware because the Holy Spirit is telling you and reminding you that you're not really a Christian because you are not really allowing Jesus to have first place in your life then my invitation to you is that it's time to repent. Time to tell God, I'm sorry. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for revealing that to me. I don't want to break your heart any longer. I want to come while I can and find this great salvation and have forgiveness of my sins and set things up inside of me the way it's supposed to be with Jesus on the throne so I can live for him tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and through this week. Let's take just a moment and pray. Almighty God, I thank you that you're here. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are speaking clearly through an open heaven now to those who need to come to say, yes, I'm coming, Jesus. Yes, I'm coming to you. Yes, I want to do it your way, God. I want to be washed of my sins. I want to have the joy of living in partnership with Jesus. Now, if that's you, I want you to raise your hand right now, wherever you are. Just raise up your hand and then put it down. You know who you are, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. There's one. Thank you. You can put your hand down now. There's another one. Thank you. You can put your hand down now. Somebody else who knows that you need to give your life to Jesus or you need to give your life back to Jesus. Help me, ushers. Are there others? Okay, here's another one, a third one. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I see one. Is there one over here? Yes, I see it. Thank you. That's four. 
Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your faithfulness. Thank you for what you're going to do in the lives of these people who are willing to admit their need to you and come to receive you. Now, I think there are two more than that, but I'm not sure. But I'm going to invite those of you who raised your hands and anyone else, and you know that you need to come and give your life to Jesus now. To, would everyone stand, please? And while they're standing, would you please come, bring your stuff, bring a friend if that's helpful, bring your things and come down here. And this give them an applaud while they're coming. Thank you, Lord, for these wise people who are coming to give their life to you tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Just as you are, and hear the Spirit call. Oh, come Making a very important decision tonight. One well, that God's been waiting for for a long time, and His heart's come full and joyful that you're coming right now. Come, come down. Don't be. Reluctant, come down. And Thank you. All right, this is uh, good. Still coming. Thank you. This is Pastor David. Uh, Pastor David is going to take you into another room. Uh, Jesus doesn't come into your heart because you need him. He came and died for you because you need him. He comes into your heart because you invite him. And Pastor David is going to lead you in that prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. And then he's going to share with you um, the, an SPT program that we have so that you can have a friend here at church that will encourage you. Listen, God is so happy about what's happening to you tonight. So would you go now with Pastor David right as he takes you. Thank you. This way. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right, sit back down for just a minute, please, because I, I didn't just share that with you so that you could get inspired and have some enjoyment and get some thinking done. I really believe God wants you to make a commitment to do about something about what you heard this evening. So, um, uh, would you put up the commit, call to commitment on the screens, please? I choose the ministry this week. I will salt and light my workplace with good works, full of joy and faith. Think about it for a minute. Think about its implications. It takes planning to do ministry. It takes a purpose of heart to live differently in conscious awareness of the presence of Jesus with you. Sometimes, I have another couple of minutes, so I want to share another example, because it's really fun. Once in a while, God surprises me with great ideas. I, last year about this time, it's the beginning of the fourth quarter at the high school. Last year about this time, I had a, a, a boy student who had just been so frustrating to me for three quarters. He flunked. And it wasn't because he was dumb. It was because he was foolish. And it just really frustrated me. I'd done everything I could to get this boy to do something. And I was so frustrated. I, and it, it wasn't, he wasn't just barely flunking. It wasn't like he had a 55%, you know, just 5 percent percentage points away from a D minus. He was like 38%. I mean, this is really poor. And, and, and he was badly behaved also. And so I, I decided, I have had it with this kid. I'm going to the, his counselor. I'm going to the administrator and have him order the counselor to take this kid out of my class. And I walked over there with purpose in my heart, intention to make this be done. And the administrator was gone for the afternoon. Well, it was lunchtime. So I went back to my room, and right after lunchtime, this kid came in, sat in the front row. And I was looking at him, and this crazy, crazy idea struck me. And I said to him quietly, after the class got started and they were doing their work, I bet you a hundred bucks you can't get an A in my class this quarter. 
His eyes got kind of big. <laughs> and he said, so what, you're going to make sure I don't? And I said, oh, no, I'm for you. He said, and what if I don't? Then I have to pay you 100 bucks? And I said, tell you what, I'll make it a one-way promise. And the boy sitting next to him said, would you do that for me? And I said, you're already getting a B. Just push it up to an A, would you? <laughs> And that boy changed his behavior, and he got an A on the next test, and he got an A on the next lab report, and he did five homeworks in a row. He hadn't done five homeworks all year long. <laughs> he wanted that hundred bucks. Now, the sad thing is, he barely got a B that quarter, but I, I also told him that if he got a good grade, I'd give it to him for the semester grade. And I did. He got a B for the semester because he learned the stuff and, and got a C on the final exam. He didn't get an A for the quarter, and so he didn't get an A for the final, and he didn't get the 100 bucks. But it was one of those God ideas, you know? God's got some of those for people around you. But you have to listen and be willing to play the game with God who set up the game and put you in it. What do you think of that? Is that cool? All right. Now, if this is what you're going to commit to do for the next five days, stand up. Just read it out loud. One, two, three. I choose the ministry this week. I will salt and light my workplace with good works full of joy and faith. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.